Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section e town hall meeting. Uh, we have very exciting topic and uh, two wonderful speakers today uh, talking a very, very modern, very exciting topic. Uh, you will, you will uh, learn a lot and uh, get very excited and inspired. Uh, first, just a few words of logistics. First, we appreciate AIWA Quarter. Uh, they provide this uh, very nice, expensive Zoom platform. And uh, also thanks to the uh, both speakers to allow us to record it. And uh, AIWA will post it on our YouTube channel and also on our uh, AIWA website. Uh, after the event, uh, to today or tomorrow, you'll receive the email notice for the links uh, to the recording and the podcast. Um, and also, uh, just a few words about AIWA. AIWA is a uh, professional organization, nonprofit promoting uh, aerospace, it's membership. Uh, so it's highly welcome if you'd like to join us, uh, great benefits and good for your career uh, and the networking and uh, uh, really very uh, good opportunities uh, here. Uh, so um, yeah, a few words about Southern California. You know, Southern California has lots of aerospace uh, activity companies, very exciting, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, many companies working on, you know, uh, related to today's topic, Artemis, uh, um, uh, and uh, many other things. Of course, SpaceX, you know, very, very uh, uh, hot company, uh, you know, these days. Uh, so um, we also regularly do events uh, with exciting speakers. For example, uh, we have Miss uh, Sid Bu, uh, sitting in the, our audience today. She's going to be the speaker um, for uh, next week. Um, you know, maybe toward the end, she can uh, share with us a few words, uh, say hello uh, at that point. Um, so I think without further ado, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, welcome our uh, speaker today, Mr. Manny uh, Panenta and uh, Felipe Van uh, Nederverde. Uh, because you read their bio online, it's very, very exciting and uh, they have wonderful career. Uh, it's a, uh, really, they are, they are on the right track uh, uh, on this uh, uh, virtual moon act activities. Uh, so, uh, well, just uh, ask them to have uh, uh, did a, uh, do, do a self brief self introduction. Uh, I think that was better. Uh, so, thank you so much, Manny and uh, Felipe. Go ahead. Thank you so much. It's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Louis. Um, really appreciate the invitation to address this group. We're excited to share with you um, what we're doing with Virtual Moon and what we plan to do. Um, so, so um, I, first, uh, uh, I'll introduce myself very briefly. I have a slide. I'm um, I have a degree in electrical engineering and a degree in computer science. Um, I uh, joined the Space Frontier Foundation um, back in the year 2000 and became very active in the organization. I ended up um, becoming Return to the Moon project manager, also organized two conferences, Return to the Moon 4 and 5 in 2004 and 2006. I've given talks and lectures uh, many places, uh, but at universities, including Princeton, Rutgers, and NYU. I'm also a founding board member of the International Lunar Observatory Association. Um, they're they're um, just about to launch a, an, an actual mission to the moon to put a telescope on the moon. So very exciting times for ILOA. And um, I also claim uh, credit for three successful space shuttle landings, um, which, uh, uh, which I have proved. Um, uh, I, did, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be invited to do a, um, uh, a flight simulation of the space shuttle in the NASA Ames vertical motion simulator, and I got a chance to do three landings. They were all successful. So that's uh, briefly about myself. Um, where this all started for me was uh, back in 1969. Uh, this, this, I was actually watching this very image uh, as it was being from the moon uh, on the occasion of the Apollo 11 landing, the first landing on the moon. And this is where my fascination with the moon started. And Philip has a similar story. 
Hi, I'm Philip van Nedervelde, and um, I've been creating metaverses since uh, 1991. Uh, metaverses have recently become a very hot uh, buzzword in uh, Silicon Valley and in the information technology industry. Um, I founded uh, my uh, studio, eSpaces, in 1993 and um, went on to uh, now have the oldest continuously operated VR studio mm -hmm. on this planet and in this solar system. And so uh, uh, together we became a, um, or in, in terms of my personal career, um, I'm now a multi-award winning 30 plus uh, years uh, veteran of the virtual reality field and one of few who uh, has continued to do VR through all those decades without interruption. Um, at age 12, I joined my local space and astronomy club and um, I've been a lifelong space settlement advocate and uh, as well as a precocious space flight journalist um, publishing my first uh, cover article in Astronomy magazine in 1986 and then in Odyssey, which was the uh, magazine for uh, junior uh, astronomers, amateur astronomers, and Countdown magazine, which some of you may remember as a magazine now defunct, but which was totally focused on uh, the entire shuttle program during the heyday of the shuttle uh, programs. Okay, so why uh, are we doing this? Why are we building this virtual moon? Um, and these are just very um, short declaratory statements about you know, the reasons that brought me to do this. So um, we all understand that to survive, we have to become a spacefaring civilization. Uh, Elon Musk can't do it alone, although perhaps he could. He's, he's, a, he's done amazing things already, so maybe he could. But let's not leave it to chess. What we really need to become a spacefaring civilization is millions of talented, dedicated people, minds focused on making that happen. Um, virtual moon is actually intended for everyone, but we are specifically targeting five to 15 year olds. Uh, they're the ones that are going to be building that future. They're the ones that are going to be creating the vision, hopefully the vision that we are going to share with you. What we want to do is let them experience that future, uh, like transport them to the future, so that they can, um, so that they can uh, figure out how to build it. First, be inspired by it, and then uh, be be um, motivated to want to build it. And then we, in order to do that, it's not just showing them the future, but giving giving them uh, uh, opportunities to participate and contribute meaningfully. Um, and since we want everyone on Earth to have access to virtual moon, to experience virtual moon, um, everyone will be able to do it for free. So um, again, what is virtual moon? Uh, so at a, a, a very basic fundamental level, it's, it's a, a simulation of the moon. But we have a very specific objective to create the most accurate, realistic, detailed, and complete simulation of the moon. Um, we're, we're using state-of-the-art VR technology. We're pushing the technology where it, need, it needs to be pushed to achieve um, the maximum level of realism and fidelity. Um, we use the latest lunar data sets, um, including real time, and uh, Philip will be talking about uh, what we mean by that. Um, and the virtual moon, uh, we want to make a virtual moon a fun and exciting place to visit and hang out with friends. Um, we have, uh, or we already have a working uh, multi-user environment that can be shared by a group of people on the moon. Um, another way to think of virtual moon is that uh, it's a space-time portal. It's a, it's a transporter that can transport you uh, through space onto the moon. Um, our, you know, our belief is that if we create a, an accurate and detailed enough simulation, it'll be just like being on the moon. So uh, you can think of it as actually being transported through time. Now, um, we're familiar with, uh, with uh, transporters from Star Trek. Uh, we actually think that our transporter 
is uh, surpasses the capabilities of the Star Trek transporter. That, that transporter only had a 40,000 kilometer range that was the maximum distance it could transport you. Since we can transport you to the moon, ours is at least 10 times as much range, about 400,000 kilometers. Plus, the other thing we can do is it's not just a space a transporter, but we can transport you through time. It's a time machine as well. So just wanted to give you a quick rundown of some of the people on the virtual moon team. Um, uh, all of these people have um, really impressive uh, biographies and uh, we just don't, for the lack of space, we're just giving you very brief highlights. But um, one of them is Dr. Jeff Hoffman, who's a retired NASA astronaut and currently teaches at MIT. Um, Eric Rosenthal uh, was a former NYU professor. And before that, he was a VP of uh, Disney Imagineering. Greg Marinek was director of the Ansari X Prize. Dr. David Trunk was an aerospace engineer and has written books on the moon, um, uh, a book actually called The Moon. Andrew Chaikin, which is a name that might be familiar to many people here. Uh, he wrote the book, A Man on the Moon, which was the basis for the HBO miniseries, From the Earth to the Moon. Um, Dan Curry was responsible for all the Star Trek visual effects on the Star Trek series and the, the movies, and he received seven Emmy Awards for his work uh, on visual effects. And uh, Dennis Wingo is a, a very uh, old friend from going back 20 years, whom I first met at, at the first Return to the Moon conference I attended. He's an engineering physicist and also wrote a book called Moon Rush. And we're hoping to find more people to join our team. Uh, if you're interested, uh, just let us know. There's room for everyone. There's a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of opportunities to contribute. And um, we, we hope that, uh, that um, you, know, you, you find this interesting enough to reach out to us and let us know. So before Virtual Moon, I founded a company called Lunar Explorer, um, and we ended up creating what, uh, what is the world's first, and it's still the only full uh, simulation of the entire moon. Um, we did this back in 2004. It was a fully immersive virtual reality experience, even though in 2004, there really wasn't a consumer level uh, virtual reality hardware. Um, so most, almost everyone that bought the, uh, the simulation had to run it on their laptops and flat screens. Um, if you're familiar, if you've ever tried virtual reality, you understand that it's, uh, it's qualitatively a completely different experience from seeing an image on a flat screen. You are immersed in the environment. It's, uh, it's a very powerful way of communicating um, uh, you know, uh, communicating your vision, of, uh, making you feel like you're, you're immersed in the environment. Um, the, uh, the simulation ran on standard computers. All you needed really was an NVIDIA graphics card with 64 megabytes of memory. And uh, we tried, we simulated every visual element. So everything that you could see if you were able to go to the moon. So that's the, the st an accurate star field, the Milky Way, um, um, the, the surface of the moon, of course. But also if you visited any of the landing sites, the Apollo or the, the Soviet lunar mission sites or the surveyor sites, if you visit any of those sites, uh, the equipment that's there now, uh, you, you can also see all the objects that were sent or left on the moon. Um, and um, hap by happy coincidence, um, even though it was created in a much older generation of uh, Windows, it, it still runs on, on the current versions of Windows. Um, wanted to share some screenshots um, from Lunar Explorer. Uh, the, the top left corner is the, uh, the Soviet lunar uh, sample return mission, one of them. Uh, and that's uh, the... Uh, the, uh, the lander and the, um, and the return vehicle. Uh, on the bottom left, you see uh, one of the Apollo landing sites with the scientific instruments dispersed throughout the surface. And then there's uh, some images taken from space. So 
Lunar Explorer allowed you to fly around in space on the vicinity of, of the moon, to orbit the moon at about 100 kilometers altitude, and to land on any spot that you chose to land um, randomly, or we also gave you an autopilot that gave you a list of locations that you could visit. Um, here are some of the, we went to many conferences and, and events uh, and carried uh, virtual moon with that, uh, sorry, Lunar Explorer. And as you see, the, um, the virtual reality headset that we use uh, is, um, you know, it's, it's an older generation. This is actually military grade equipment. And that visor alone cost uh, $30,000. Um, so obviously, you know, the technology was years, more than a decade away from becoming um, available to the public. But we built um, Lunar Explorer with the anticipation that uh, virtual reality would be coming. And so uh, right from the beginning, I wanted it to be a VR experience. So I just wanted to point out a couple of people here. On the upper right-hand corner, that's uh, Bert Rutan uh, walking on the moon virtually. Um, and this is maybe four or five weeks after he won the Ansari X Prize for um, uh, Spaceship One having reached space, the first, the first commercially built uh, spacecraft to reach space. Um, on the upper left-hand side, um, the, the person using the visor is Robert Picardo. He was the holographic doctor on Star Trek Voyager series. And on the lower right-hand corner, um, uh, just uh, a few people, a couple of people from NASA. The, the person on the blue shirt on the right is Dr. Dan Rasky. He's the one that actually uh, got me the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to fly the space shuttle simulator. And uh, the person standing next to me on my right with the white shirt, that's my, uh, that's my dad. Um, my dad has passed uh, since then, but one of one of the uh, best memories I have of spending time with him was uh, taking him on my trip to um, to Los Angeles for this conference. Um, we tried to be uh, to pay as much attention to, to detail as we could, and uh, and included every object that we know of uh, exists on the moon. So a lunar explorer, if you walk around. Um, the Apollo sites, you'll see objects like the, the Charlie Duke um, family picture. You can actually walk around and you'll, you'll find it on the ground. Or the, um, the fallen astronaut uh, memorial, um, that's also uh, replicated in, in Lunar Explorer. And then we had further plans for Lunar Explorer. We actually created a lunar rover racing game and um, we're just about to release it. We're very near the point where we uh, were releasing it to the public, but we uh, ran out of funding and that never, that was never actually done. But um, everything that we've showed you about Lunar Explorer is we're going to, to in incorporate into Virtual Moon. All the features, everything that you see here and, and then go beyond that. The, um, the images that you saw, you know, the resolution is very poor. The database that we use for Lunar Explorer is based on the Clementine mission. It was based, it was elevation information that was derived from, from stereoscopic uh, visual images, and it's very poor resolution. Now that we have the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data set, which is up to 50 times the, uh, the level of detail or resolution of the, um, of the Clementine data set, that'll create a much more dramatic visual uh, simulation. Uh, as an example, so this is the Apollo 11 landing site short, shortly after landing uh, from Lunar Explorer. And what I'm gonna show you next is, is a very early version. You can think of it as, as storyboard level uh, demo, very early demo of the same scene in Virtual Moon. Um, so you can see the difference in quality of the image. But again, uh, Virtual Moon, uh, we're, we're just getting started. That, that everything that we're gonna show you today is early demo. Um, and nothing is in its finished state yet. And it will, be, it will be improved far beyond what you're seeing here. 
So um, I'll turn it over to Philip uh, to talk a little bit about the technology behind vir virtual moon and, um, and what's possible with it. So Philip. Thank you, Manny. So um, with virtual moon, we, our challenge or our goals were first of all to have to keep everything that was realized in Lunar Explorer and then take all of that to the next level uh, by updating the technology and also by pushing the envelope of some relevant uh, VR and interactive 3D graphics technologies. What you're seeing on the screen here is the menu of our current alpha version of uh, Virtual Moon, which uh, suitably has an under construction site dangling from the south pole of the moon because um, we, we have basically uh, the virtual moon under construction. And um, we've, uh, in various stages of development, we have the south pole uh, of the moon, uh, we have the Apollo 11 Tranquility Base um, and, uh, and other aspects, uh, some of which we will be demonstrating at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. One technology that we are bringing to uh, Virtual Moon is the ability to access the same simulation from any device, any device, and also via a browser. So it's not a standalone application anymore. You can access it in any browser, on any device, anywhere, anytime. Remember, as Manny explained, Lunar Explorer was only accessible in, uh, on a particular VR headset um, and on flat screen Windows machines, Virtual Moon, will be totally agnostic when it comes to access devices. So you will be able to access Virtual Moon in single user or in multi-user mode from any device, including smartphones, tablets, Windows laptops, Macintosh laptops, desktops, uh, Linux uh, desktop PCs, uh, workstations, uh, as well as uh, immersive VR headsets. You will access the, not yet Manny. Um, so uh, immersive VR headsets and then augmented reality headsets and also not pictured on this uh, slide, game consoles. So every time you will access your browser, your, one, your favorite browser on the device that you're using and then punch in the URL for Virtual Moon, and then, hey, presto, you'll be there. And uh, you can mix and match as you please. So one person can come in from a tablet, another can come in from a VR headset, a third can come in from a PC laptop. It doesn't matter. You will all access the same multi-user uh, virtual scenes. If I could have the next slide, um, Manny. Another technology that we are bringing to Virtual Moon um, is cloud rendering, consumer affordable GPU cloud rendering. Now, what is that? Uh, well, not everybody has a powerful uh, PC or device capable of real-time ray tracing and ultra photorealistic graphics. Typically, that's the province of um, deep-pocketed uh, gamers uh, who have a fire-breathing dragon of a gaming PC. But, you know, um, John and Jane Doe uh, or their children, they don't have that. Now, the goal with Virtual Moon is to provide as good an experience. It's the next best thing to being on the moon. Uh, it's, it's just like going to the moon except for the launch and uh, the travel time through physical space. And so um, we are working closely together with uh, one of the leaders, industry leaders in uh, 3D graphics, which is NVIDIA. And so they've developed a uh, technology called Cloud XR. Next slide, please. Um, in the context of their ambition to create a holodeck. And so 
um, but make that holodeck available on underpowered uh, machines, uh, as well as, of course, uh, highly powered uh, machines. So next slide, please. The technology enables you to do real-time ray tracing at 120 frames per second on a smartphone or on an underpowered, uh, untethered VR headset. In this case, you see a demo where a very, very high polygon 3D model of a race car is being rendered uh, real time um, in an augmented reality setup on this smartphone and uh, with real time ray tracing, which as some of you may know, is very computer intensive. Um, next slide, please. So the way this works is that at the top, you have your underpowered devices, uh, untethered VR headsets, smartphones, tablets, et cetera. And then uh, you have various layers um, through which you need to go. But the, if we have the next slide, please. The next slide shows how via a 5G uh, connection or broader bandwidth connection, uh, the end user's device can access a GPU server, a server somewhere in a data center in the cloud, hence CloudXR, uh, which will do the heavy lifting of ray tracing and real-time 3D graphics at 120 frames a second, et cetera, uh, for the end user. And then using that 5G or better bandwidth connection that with very little additional latency those graphics will be piped to that underpowered edge device. Next slide, please. Um, here is a system architecture overview of a metaverse that we are currently building. And it shows you um, some of the technology that we are also using for virtual moon. I will draw your attention, especially to the bottom part, the bottom third of this uh, graphic, which shows you the technical um, routing, if you like, or the, the architecture rather for how we interface with all these devices at the, uh, at the edge and how cloud-based renderers are providing the same multi-user virtual reality scene to all the users, regardless of which device they are using to access the scene. Next slide, please. One more technology that I wanted to mention is that um, the metaverse uh, that we are building uh, uses latest state-of-the-art blockchain technology um, because we, of course, will be uh, enabling um, the use of an internal currency uh, to power the internal economy of our metaverse. And so... Similarly, we're using the same technology under the bonnet uh, to power Virtual Moon's own internal currency because in Virtual Moon, uh, it will have its own currency called the Lunar, L-U-N-A-R. And so the underpinning of that, uh, uh, the techno magic to drive that will be a state-of-the-art blockchain technology intimately integrated in our virtual reality platform. So again, um, the, the entire virtual moon experience will be browser based. Any browser, Google, uh, Chrome, or uh, Safari, or Firefox, doesn't matter. Uh, you just punch in the URL and hey presto, hey presto, you're on the moon. So, and that's where you will end up. This is a, a screenshot of uh, one of the scenes that we have been working on, which is uh, Tranquility Base, as it looks, to, as, it, as it would appear to you uh, today if you were to travel there. And so um, this, um, this scene is complete with uh, dynamic shadows. So we have a slider enable you, enabling you to move the, the sun uh, around uh, the scene. And then you can see the shadows uh, move around in real time as well and change the color uh, of, the, uh, of the US flag, et cetera. 
Okay. So um, virtual moon is going to be, thank you, Philip. Uh, virtual moon is going to be a simulation of the moon um, as it exists today. But we told you uh, at the beginning that, uh, that it's also a space-time portal to the moon. So it'll also be a, um, a simulation of the moon as it existed in the past and as it will exist in the future. One of the main features that we're, uh, that we're going to incorporate into virtual moon is a large city on the moon, on the south pole of the moon, on the, specifically on Malapert Mountain. So a couple of years ago, I did a presentation explaining the concept uh, behind uh, Malapert City. Now, Malapert City has evolved as a concept since then and uh, has acquired a new name. The name was, uh, was um, Helen, Helen's um, suggestion and, and the, the new name for the Malapert city is Celine. So everything that we're going to talk about here applies to Celine, but again, it's been evolved over the last couple of years. Actually, the whole concept has been evolving over almost 20 years, but, um, but the, the, the um, name Celine is fairly new. So at this conference, I spoke about the, the concept behind Malapert City. Um, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, okay, we have, uh, with, uh, with the lunar uh, topology ne near the South Pole. So the South Pole um, uh, matches with the, the rim of Shackleton Crater at about the 10 o'clock position. And just to the north of that is, a, is Malapert Mountain. It's a very tall mountain, 8,000 8, meters from, from the base to the, to the top. At the, at the top of Malapert, there's a fairly flat, sort of gently sloping six degree grade um, plateau. And that's where we're planning to build the city. Sorry about the misalignment. These, uh, these red marks are not where they're supposed to be, but if you can see my cursor, so the location of uh, Malapert City is somewhere here. Um, and uh, these are so the primary requirements and the features of uh, Malapert City. We want to build it underground. Um, yeah, the reasons are obvious because of um, the, the thermal environment, the radiation environment, and the micrometeoroid environment. Uh, underground gives you protection from all three. Uh, we want Malapert City to be, sorry, Celine, um, to be uh, as close to a natural environment as possible. Um, so when people go there and visit, it'll be comfortable, it'll be a beautiful, accommodating environment, and, uh, and it'll feel completely natural. So we want normal atmospheric pressure and composition. Uh, this poses a challenge because there's uh, virtually no nitrogen on the moon. So all the nitrogen to build the, the atmosphere would have to be, would have to come from the, from the earth. Um, one important stipulation is that Malapert City is going to be designed to be actually buildable. So we can only use current and near-term technology. We can't assume that there will be, you know, for example, Star Trek transporters and and, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, only technology that we're already familiar with that exists that you can buy off the shelf or that will become available in the next, let's say 10 to 15 years, fully mature and available to use. Um, initially, Malapert City was designed for 3000 people. The idea is that it didn't have to be self-sufficient right off the gate. It could evolve to become self-sufficient over time. Um, it, it's designed as a permanent city, so a minimum 200 years operational life. So all the systems and all the, the reliability needed to keep the city uh, running for two centuries uh, would have to be part of the design. Um, the, the primary purpose for um, Celine um, is, uh, is a, a destination, travel destination uh, for adventure travel and R&R. It, you can think of it as a sort of a combination of uh, a mini Las Vegas with, with uh, Disneyland with, uh, with a vacation resort. Um, and, uh, 
and and we we really think that the tourism space tourism is sort of the will be the main economic driver for uh, for creating or or boot, bootstrapping our uh, space economy and you know evidence of that is already uh, is already out there with the with the suborbital flights by um, by Virgin Galactic and and by uh, Blue Origin, and also uh, you know there have been tourists that have traveled to the to the space station, and uh, and regular civilians uh, traveling to space in SpaceX's uh, Spaceship One, um, all of that is in the works. So uh, space tourism, uh, we really feel strongly it'll be a, a strong driver, economic driver of. Uh, development of cis lunar economy. Um, so the, the, the whole idea behind the, the concept of Malapert City was uh, when I was uh, returned to the Moon Project Manager at the Space Frontier Foundation, you know, we, we would uh, uh, attend these conferences and, and um, put on these conferences and lots of experts would come from all over the world and they'd share their ideas and concepts. But after the conference, everybody dispersed and the ideas just remained disjointed. I wanted to create sort of a, a nucleus uh, or a focus for um, all these ideas to, to be synthesized and, and organized and uh, sort of uh, become an evolving uh, concept, an evolving design for, um, for Malapert City, again, uh, which, uh, which is now called Celine. But um, over time, we would, we would uh, evolve this design until it was actually buildable. That is the main requirement. It, um, we want to make it as spectacular um, a, a technology achievement and engineering achievement as possible, uh, whatever the technology would enable us to achieve, but it's got to be buildable. Because if, if we make it buildable, it'll be believable. So um, this is the concept for Celine. Uh, it, basically, the same sort of uh, layout for uh, for the uh, the underground city. And I should mention that this is just a baseline design. We are not uh, constrained to the specific shape and so on. But uh, as a starting point, uh, we needed to pick a baseline design so we could start uh, putting together. Uh, high-level plan on how this could be done. So uh, according to this design, as you see, the, the volume um, drives, uh, for example, the, how much nitrogen we need to bring from the Earth in order to have a one atmosphere um, uh, environment inside a virtual city, inside of, sorry, inside of Celine. And um, the, the internal surface area is, so these are the, the main uh, metrics that drive all of the other design parameters. Um, so this is a, a very, very old um, uh, slide. I created this almost 20 years ago to show uh, where Celine would be built in relation to the, to the mountain. So the, here is the plateau of uh, Malapur, uh, showing the six degree northeast slope, northwest slope, sorry. and um, and uh, Celine would actually be a, a tunnel that's dug into the slope of Malapert and excavated out. And then it would have to be sealed. It would have to create some kind of a pressure envelope to contain the atmosphere. And um, so we'd have to think about, you know, what, what are, how do we do that? Um, there are a lot of aspects to this concept, you know, design aspects that uh, have not been uh, tied down. Again, th this is a very early concept and uh, we want to evolve it and take advantage of um, new technologies as they become available and eventually be able to actually build this. Um, up until uh, very recently, I really had no idea how we're going to transport all the, all the mass, all the material that we need to the moon to build Celine. Uh, until uh, Elon Musk came along and, and Spaceship One, um, uh, sorry, as Starship is now the game changer. With Starship, we really think 
um, Celine is possible, we can build it. So um, a Starship uh, will take, uh, will achieve orbit with, uh, with a, a, a full cargo bay uh, capable of, of taking 100 tons, metric tons uh, of uh, mass to orbit. Once in orbit, um, it will be, have to be refueled up to 10 times to refill its, uh, its uh, propellant tanks. And then once the propellant tanks are full, it can travel to the moon and land 100 tons of uh, mass on the moon. So as, as you all know, the uh, uh, SpaceX has won the Artemis lunar land uh, uh, contract, and they're, they're working on designs for Spaceship One versions that are capable of landing on the moon. <clears throat> so in order to build uh, Selene, we need uh, a lot of starships. So we uh, constrained the mass requirements to what we could deliver to the moon with a thousand payloads, starship payloads. Uh, so here we, we're showing you 100 um, starship, uh, 100 starships. Uh, now, Elon Musk is going to build thousands of these. So uh, building 100 starships is not, um, is not a, uh, something that's going to stop us. It, it, it'll be easy. I mean, um, Elon Musk is going to build thousands of them. Maybe it would be willing to sell a few. Uh, but uh, I wanted to show you a visual of what a thousand starships traveling to the moon looks like. Um, so uh, with the mass uh, transport capabilities uh, of a thousand starships, we decided to try to find out uh, if we can actually do this. Now, um, sending a thousand starships to the moon and returning back to Earth, uh, refilling them with cargo, sending them back again 10 times each, um, uh, that, that would not be the smart, smart way of doing it. Um, because, you know, this Starship is very configurable. Um, the, uh, the, the version of Starship that's designed to fly to orbit and, and return back to the moon has to have shielding, has to have aerodynamic surfaces, has to have um, sea level um, rocket engines. None of those things are required in space. So uh, the concept would be that Starship carries uh, cargo modules inside, uh, something like standardized shipping containers, like intermodal containers. It, it offloads the cargo modules and then the, we attach the cargo modules to a a purpose-designed um, space tug or space barge that can take multiple payloads to the moon, but it's only designed to operate in space. So all of the all of the features that are not needed are also mass savings uh, and improve our efficiency in transporting material between the Earth and the moon. So it would be something like this. This is this is just an approximate concept. You know, it, it's not. It, it, it wasn't specifically done for this, uh, to illustrate this concept. It's something close to the idea that I found online. And I uh, got permission from Jim Vaughn to use, uh, for which we are thankful. Um, so Starship, um, this, this uh, particular slide so shows Starship carrying uh, Starlink satellites to orbit. But instead of the satellites, again, we could have those um, intermodal standardized containers and just, you know, get to orbit, open up, extract the cargo, attach it to the space tug, and then send it on to the moon. So, um, so this illustrates kind of the, of the process. We, we carry, we launch, uh, let's say, six um, payloads to orbit. We would um, it, uh, attach those payloads to a space tug, which is basically a, a propulsion unit uh, with fill the, the propellant tanks, will set, would send it off to the moon. Now, we, we also uh, don't want to send um, these, um, these uh, purpose-designed space tugs all the way to the surface of the moon. So we would want to tra transport between low Earth orbit and the Lagrange 1 point. And uh, 
And then from there, there'll be another purpose designed, specially designed um, transporter to take it from there to the, to the moon surface. Now, all of these uh, specially designed transportation systems could just use the basic spaceship uh, start, sorry, SpaceX technology. So, you know, we would just reconfigure the rocket engines and the, and the fuel tanks and, and structural components uh, to, to build these things out of the primary uh, SpaceX components that they're using to build Starship. And uh, so we did a, a, a mass uh, budget study to see if, we, if this could be done under 100,000 uh, metric tons. And we came up with a total of 96,000 tons. And so uh, in this mass budget, for example, we can carry enough material to, uh, to build uh, or to manufacture 50,000 tons of steel. Um, we would basically just send in the, uh, the alloys that, you, that we combine with iron to make the steel because we can extract the iron right from the lunar regolith. So we would need um, processing plants on the surface to extract uh, iron and other, other materials um, like oxygen and, uh, and aluminum and uh, whatever materials we need. Uh, but um, the, uh, the use of, of processing plants to extract resources from the moon is critical to, ma to making this possible. Um, the only other thing I wanted to point out here is um, we talked about a pressure envelope. So to build a pressure envelope inside the tunnel or the excavation that, that will become Selene, we're anticipating that graphene will be available at that time. We can already manufacture pure um, monolayer graphene sheets in, in square meter sizes. That's been done years back already. So uh, the, idea, uh, the idea is in 20 years or so, we should be able to manufacture graphene, pure sheets of graphene in industrial quantities. And if we can do that, uh, we, we need 187 tons of graphene that will create a one millimeter thick graphene membrane that will become our pressure envelope inside of the tunnel. And in terms of structural strength, a one millimeter of graphene is equivalent to about a foot, 200 millimeters or a foot of uh, steel. Um, so this is, I mean, uh, there's more detail to this. I uh, just wanted to uh, give an idea of, of the plans that we have. Now, we're going, to, we're going to be replicating this entire process in virtual moon at some point. We're going to show how uh, not just, not just uh, Celine in its completed form that people can travel through and explore immersively and, uh, and meet meet their friends there and go for, um, you know, uh, go see events or, or go take tours of Celine. Um, but we also will show the, the, the actual construction, how materials were carried and how it was built. Some of the key technologies that will be essential to building Celine are listed here. Uh, uh, we're thinking there's a good chance that we'll have nuclear fusion in 20 years. But again, the running joke with nuclear fusion is it's always been 20 years away. But it doesn't have to be fusion. It could be uh, fission, uh, small modular fission reactors. But um, the idea for, the, idea, the main idea for power is that, yeah, we could build solar panels, um, but solar panels, even even on the top of Malapert, and one of the reasons for choosing Malapert is because it's, it's a peak of eternal sunlight. Um, however, it's, it's called a peak of eternal sunlight, but there's actually periods of darkness. So solar panels are not going to give you continuous power. Um, and one of the things that, that we want, one of the things that will make this possible is to have all the power that you need. You don't want to be power limited. If you have enough power, you can do anything that you want. But the other technologies are thermal management, of course, life support. Again, life support systems 
uh, are running right now on the space station and, and various space craft. But again, this will have to be much larger in scale. And also we want the life support systems to be fully closed loop so they don't have to be replenished. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's a, a primary goal for self-sufficiency is that all your life support systems are completely recycled. Uh, advanced robotics, robotics, uh, especially driven by artificial intelligence. Uh, we talked about graphene. There are many other advanced materials that will become um, critical or beneficial to building Selene. Um, getting a, a handle on all the technology to, to do in-situ resource utilization, all the processing plants to create glass and steel and oxygen and aluminum and every, all the other materials that you need. Uh, one um, of the primary um, challenges for colonizing the moon, for building large structures and, and living on the moon is dust mitigation. To my knowledge, um, we, are still, we still don't have a foolproof system of how to manage the dust on the moon. The dust is very corrosive. It's very dangerous to human health. And, uh, and we have to figure out exactly how we can um, uh, prevent contamination. So, um, so we talked about the importance of robotics. We envision that Selene will be built completely by robots in 20 or 25 years. Robots should have uh, equivalent dexterity to human beings or, or even far sur surpass human dexterity. Um, and here I'm showing you, again, a, a, a swarm of robots. So for the moon, um, to build Selene on the moon, we, um, we would ship literally thousands of robots in various sizes with different functions and capabilities. They would all work together as a, as a robotic swarm or a, or a nest of like an ant nest. Um, they all communicate amongst themselves. They all have individual tasks to do. This is a, a um, very um, robust way of building structures on the moon because you can have multiple um, units of these robots fail and the remaining uh, colony uh, or swarm will still be able to complete the job. Um, one of the things about dust mitigation, if you don't use wheels and use articulated limbs instead, you can actually cover all the moving parts, all the articulated hinges and so on, cover them with some kind of fabric to keep out the dust, um, which is not possible with wheels. So this is one possible approach to mitigating the, the dust uh, challenge. Now, with all this mass and all this technology, the, the robotic swarms and, and unlimited power, what we can build on the moon could be spectacular. This is not a shot of what Selene will look like inside. It's a shot of, of what it could look like inside. Um, we don't have any architectural um, renderings yet, but we do have um, an announcement uh, just, uh, just in the last couple of weeks or so. Um, uh, Alfredo Munoz joined Virtual Moon. He, uh, he has a, an architectural company called Avivo, and uh, he's uh, already started working on some internal concepts for the design of Selene. We're very excited to, to get those. And at some point in the future, we'll uh, we be able to arrange another presentation to this group, and we'll be able to give you, um, to show you updates and, and the ongoing work. So again, um, uh, all of the all that we're seeing here is possible within the mess budget budget that we talked about before. But you know, Celine will be a spectacular place to visit. Um, as I said, uh, you won't have to wait until 2045 to visit Celine because it'll be available in Virtual Moon. Uh, much, much sooner than that. We're hoping within the next year or so, we should have uh, Celine um, to a point where you can visit and experience what it's like. Um, now, it's not just going to be a visual simulation. That's another important point. 
What we want to do is we want to prove um, from an engineering point of view that saline is actually possible. It can actually be built. So we're using a concept called a digital twin. A digital twin is basically a, a digital simulation of a physical component or system or equipment. Uh, digital twins are, are already widely used in many industries. For example, um, uh, Boeing aircraft, as they're flying through the air, are collecting data on the performance of all the uh, jet engines and, uh, and beaming that data in real time to the Boeing company. And they, they have digital twins of the jet engines. So the, the, the jet engines are driven by actual real world data and they, they function and perform just like the, um, in the simulation, they function and perform just like the actual uh, jet engine does. And so, um, you know, all the interfaces are defined, all the, all of them, like fuel flows and mass flows and temperatures and all that, the, the simulator acts exactly like the real thing. So by, we're going to create digital twins for all of the life support systems, the power systems, the, you know, the, the, the um, communication systems, all the systems required to keep uh, virtual uh, to keep Celine running will be replicated as virtual twins, and that will be the uh, engineering proof that it can be built. Virtual twin uh, digital twins can be um, built as hierarchy. So we saw before the jet engine as a digital twin, but it, it's just a component of a, a, a higher level digital twin of an entire airplane. And you can have many multiple levels of hierarchy of digital twins connecting each other, working uh, uh, together as, as systems, uh, all the way up to the level of the city. So all of, um, all of Celine will be a digital twin functioning as a, a, a full, complete city, virtual city. And, uh, and the, the thing that makes all this uh, possible and compelling is, is virtual reality. So Arthur C. Clarke um, envisioned that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is basically magic. Uh, um, and we, we feel virtual reality has that, those characteristics. It's, uh, as we said, you, know, we, you think of it, it can, it can be a transporter beam that beams you to the surface of the moon. And it can be a time machine that beams you across time to the past and the future and anywhere in between and the present as well. So, you know, virtual moon gives you the sense of being there. You know, it's, it's a, what we want virtual moon to be is a, is a jaw dropping experience. That's, that's what this slide is supposed to illustrate. Um, in addition, we also uh, have built already a sun, earth, moon, orbital mechanics module. So this is uh, another tool of, for time traveling where you, can, where you can, using the orbital mechanics, you can move a time slide to the past or the future. And for example, you can, uh, you can move a time slide to, uh, to a total solar eclipse. And while standing on the moon, you can watch a solar eclipse from the surface of the moon, what it looked like as the moon casts its shadow on the surface of the earth. And uh, as we said, primarily we want to reach uh, kids, all the kids in the world, bring them to Celine, bring them to the future, have them experience what that future is going to look like, and then uh, give them the chance to participate in design contests, to design various systems for Celine. Uh, or, um, you know, uh, actually design uh, uh, activities that they can do, uh, have fun with their friends on the moon. They can do uh, lunar roving ra rover races. They can, uh, we, we have plans for a, a lunar academy in Celine where they can take classes and learn about orbital mechanics and rocket science and, and Treasure and hunts and having to do with STEM and so on. And, Say again, and, Bill. And treasure hunts. Um, I wanted to add to this that while indeed the target audience, the target's demographic and psychographic are five to fifteen year olds, 
We will also be um, offering a version for the space industry for professionals. Um, and that version will be called Virtual Moon Pro. And that will come with features that are of uh, only of, well, primarily of interest to professionals uh, for, the, for doing mission planning, for doing sandbox uh, type simulations, for doing uh, EVA training uh, on the moon, et cetera. And so that is one of the ways that we can keep the uh, version for kids uh, free. And um, because, you know, uh, it, it does cost money to produce all this. Uh, and um, Virtual Moon Pro will be one of the ways of monetizing uh, all of the work. Um, for example, uh, we are already talking with uh, projects. I won't know, name names, but uh, one of them uh, uh, is planning to send a rover to the South Pole of the moon. And uh, they would like to have very accurate calculations of how much sunlight is reaching the solar cells on the on the back of the row of the uh, of the um, unmanned um, robot. And so they want to uh, use Virtual Moon Pro to calculate the amount of sunlight uh, available on particular slopes uh, in the landing area so that they can pick a track. It's like guiding the, uh, the robots that are on Mars, but they can pick a track that will maximize the amount of sun hitting the uh, little robot rover uh, all the way on the south pole of the moon where you know some areas are, are not um, uh, benefiting of much sunlight. Another application um, that we are uh, looking at is doing a real-time broadcast uh, via on the internet of um, it, from inside uh, virtual moon to show the the telemetry data streaming in real time from the moon on another mission. Uh, where they the, the, the plan of the mission, uh, this is a real mission, um, is to land a number of uh, a swarm of robots in an area of the moon that is very rich in lava tunnels. And so these, uh, this robot swarm would go and explore and enter into these lava tunnels. And they would, a little bit like you saw in the science fiction movie Prometheus, where there's a bunch of flying devices that map the interior of a large cathedral-like space. Well, uh, some of these lava tunnels on the moon are big enough to hold uh, entire cathedrals actually, and, and maybe even a, as tall as the Eiffel Tower, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And so the idea would be to that the telemetry from that swarm of robots, as it is entering that lava tunnel and mapping it in 3D, uh, that telemetry data would be piped to Earth. Uh, and then we at Virtual Moon, we would show the interior of that lava tunnel resing or appearing live in real time as the telemetry from the moon comes in. And then people would be able to uh, experience that in live in multi-user mode inside of that virtual uh, version, uh, that digital twin, if you like, of that lava tunnel, uh, either in VR or AR or flat screen or on their smartphone, etc. So that's a new spin, a new take on how to do live uh, mission uh, reporting uh, live from the moon in virtual reality. Thank you very much, Philip. Um... So the exciting part of the presentation is coming up and, uh, and it's, uh, it's our way of proving to you that uh, Virtual Moon is a space-time portal to the moon. Uh, what we're going to do is if you have your, um, your, your Oculus headsets ready, we're uh, going to Manny, give you, uh, yes. Maybe we should offer people uh, a quick opportunity to ask us any questions while we explain so if you have any questions, um, 
get them to us via the the text chat and then we can uh, we, we can answer some questions while we give yeah. you the information while we give you the while we give you the information that you will need uh, in order to experience um, the Apollo 11 landing inside of your Oculus Quest 2 VR headset. Yeah, Philip, I think uh, uh, Bob, uh, Mr. Casho has, has several questions. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, uh, fascinating uh, presentation. My uh, uh, commendations to you both for such a, a, long, a long process, long project. Um, as a film and television professional, uh, is Virtual Moon or its technology going to be, or is it already being made use of for filmmakers to be able to depict uh, certain historical or even future um, activities, uh, but in a, a flat, in a uh, television or in a film way, using it basically your rendering technology and your data sets and other sorts of things? The answer is we're not ready to do that today, uh, although we're not that far away from it, uh, arguably. But one of the goals of the Virtual Moon project, we didn't get into that, is to also be a resource for uh, entertainment uh, production uh, houses, studios. Um, because you know you, you can do your location scouting, but it's kind of hard to check out uh, to go and check out on the real moon uh, what your location looks like for your next television series or movie where you need to or commercial where you are uh, doing something on the moon. So our technology is intended to be so uh, photorealistic, so high quality um, that, we will, we intend, it is uh, by design, our intention to offer a virtual moon to the entertainment industry uh, in order for them to basically use it as a virtual studio, as a virtual set, so that you can use uh, all of the asset produced by virtual moon to go and shoot um, using green screen or chroma key technology or, or, um, or the, or other ways of uh, blending uh, live uh, footage, uh, live um, uh, action with uh, the uh, real-time ray traced imagery uh, of virtual moon. So a, a very emphatic yes. And um, one of the, when, when Manny and I were drafting the business plan for Celine, uh, what, one of the, uh, one of the, money makers, revenue generators, aside from having a casino, a museum, a, and a, a one-sixth gravity uh, acrobatics uh, gym, etc., cetera, um, was also to offer a, uh, a studio facility for the entertainment industry in, in Celine, the virtual Celine, and then later, uh, have it also in the real Celine, so that there is a. You remember what Manny said about this match between the digital twin and the the physical one. So our goal, uh, if we ever and we we do intend to one day see uh, Celine built in in reality, in physical reality on the moon, uh, we would offer the same virtual studios there uh, to the entertainment industry, but then physical ones. Thank you. My second question, I think you've touched on, but have you considered sighting Celine inside one of the lunar lava tubes to eliminate the necessity of excavation since it's already been done by, by the lava itself? Uh, we, we, we have. Um, the, one of the reasons that I like the Malapert uh, site for Celine is that um, it, it's got a, a fantastic view of the earth. The earth is low in the horizon. You can just, you know, look, look out straight. You don't have to look straight up or, or uh, in an uncomfortable position. And one of the primary reasons that people will probably want to go to the moon is to look at the earth from the moon. Um, so, and, and then also you want, to, you want to look at the spectacular views from a high point, a high viewpoint, and the spectacular landscaping, landscape around that site. 
in a virtual, in a, in a lava tube, you don't have any of that. You lose that. It, it's a very convenient way technologically to build a habitat, but as far as, um, as the uh, aesthetics of the location, we think Malapert beats it hands down. Interesting. Given the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty, who or what would either be responsible for or claim sovereignty of, of the city of Saline? Would it be an independent republic? Would it be an outpost of a given nation? Or would it be some other entity that you're proposing? Uh, I'll, um, if I may, Manny, I'll sure. feel that one. So uh, one of my other interests is uh, seasteading. And um, as you may know, that is an interest of, of some people of creating new countries, new states on artificial islands built out in the ocean outside of international waters. And so um, the initial version of Selim will probably be owned by a, of the physical Selim on the real moon, will probably be a consortium uh, of multiple countries, uh, investors, etc. And so that will, um, that will not be its own country. However, um, at some point in the future of Celine, after it gets going and you know, it, 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 it turns a profit and, and all the kinks uh, technologically are, are worked out, um, then we hope that Celine one day might um, at a junk, come to a juncture where it says, hey, you know, why not declare ourselves uh, our own country? And uh, so, uh, and, and then we, we might claim more land than just uh, the, the Malapert Mountain. Um, so I don't know if that's uh, the answer to the question that you were looking for. Uh, it's just something that uh, uh, being a student of space history, I know we tend to understandably focus on the technology, the kind of the adventure aspects of it. And, and there's much merit in, in that kind of research. But eventually, you know, we'll have to confront the, the, the legal and the administrative aspects, because uh, if you want to claim, a, uh, if you want to make a country, there are, um, you know, some legal ramifications for that and how that uh, lines up with uh, uh, what's already been negotiated with the Inter uh, International Space Treaty. I'm sure you're familiar with Quest magazine, the very good uh, uh, magazine of space history. They had a, a very good article uh, about this where they interviewed one of NASA's uh, um, legal directors and he, he talked about, you know, just for example, what is sovereignty on the International Space Station? Do you move from the Russian segment to the European one? You know, whose territory are you now in? And, and that may be a kind of a, a, a prosaic uh, issue, but let's say in the future that a child is born in space, would, it, would their nationality be pegged to which module they were in? Um, it's, it's something that has to be addressed at some point. And so being far seeing and far thinking technologically, we also need to be far seeing and far thinking uh, in, in uh, civil matters as well. Yes, so um, I, th that is a very interesting topic and it's, it's really uh, far out in the future. Although, you know, things could happen quickly because if you look at Elon Musk's plan, uh, his plans call for a, a city with a million inhabitants on Mars. And uh, I know that he is uh, conservative or libertarian. Uh, and uh, so he is interested in seasteads and in creating uh, one's own country as well. And I think it, it makes total sense that at some point, provided that the colony uh, can be self-sustaining and really independent from Earth, um, if it's completely self-sufficient, then there comes a point where, just like uh, the way America was uh, created, uh, where the colony might be interested in declaring itself an independent new country. And um, with Celine, uh, while that is not the, the primary goal, um, one way of monetizing the work that goes into the design of Celine and then later the building of the actual Celine is to offer the blueprints of the Celine construction uh, project to others who might um, create a, another Celine with the same technology to uh, 
to 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 stake out a a new country somewhere else on the moon. Hey, my, I, final, I, my final my is: uh, Are you familiar with Dr. Von Freeman's uh, company and patent uh, photo to Topo, which uses uh, visual light photography to generate topographic information, LAN lidar? It seems like it has a very uh, applicable to your project here. It's a uh, photogrammetry technology. It, it's it's it yes, it generates uh, photogrammic uh, data sets, but it does not use lidar, so it avoids the uh, the problems of, of lidar, and you have complete uh, color and texture fidelity. I put his uh, website. He's here in Atlanta. I happen to know him, and he's got a fascinating uh, technology set originally designed to explore caves virtually because they're environmentally sensitive places but it allowed people to, to visit and fly around the caves, not as a simulation done with a graphics engine like gaming, but using the actual photograph and textures, but now renderable in 3D space. So his, um, his link is in, is in the uh, Q&A. That's great. If you could uh, share the link to his website in the chat, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Do we have other questions in the chat? I haven't had an opportunity to check in the chat if there's questions there, Manny. I, I think there's another question. No? Yeah, can you see the, the chat? Chat box, I mean, the Q and A box. Uh, yeah. I can't see the question. Yeah, the question um, is how much money would be needed for the first launch for Celine? Like to, to build Celine completely? You mean the um, virtual or the physical one? Uh, I don't know, maybe both. <laughs> I'll let you speak so, to the physical one, Manny. Yeah, so and as part of the, the mass budget study, I also uh, sort of uh, did a, a a um, order of magnitude uh, look at the, at the eco economics of building Celine. The, and, and I think it could be built for uh, half a trillion dollars, 500 billion. And so as we were asking in, in, in early if uh, Elon Musk would, would do it, at, in 20 years, Elon Musk would have uh, far surpassed the $500 billion uh, wealth mark, and uh, if he wanted to do this on his own all by himself, he would be able to. Yeah, uh, many Philip, uh, uh, Luke, and some people say they might have to leave. So, uh, if it's possible, maybe you can uh, uh, show the demo earlier yeah. if you like. Yeah, and see if any yes. other questions. But yeah, we can we can answer questions after the demo. Additional questions. Um, so. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get into the demo. Uh, Philip, do you want to set up, set it up? Um, no, go ahead. You have the next slide with the details. Okay, so basically you go oh, on your oh. Oculus, open yeah, up the ahead. browser app and type in, uh, do they have to type in HTTPS or just moon.espaces.com? Okay, so when you are in your uh, Oculus, you need to fire up your browser, the browser that comes with your Quest, um, and then type in moon.e-spaces.com slash go. And then um, you will see the, the, the scene load in the browser. And after it loads, then you can uh, click on uh, making the uh, environment fully immersive in Quest. You'll see an icon uh, that enables you in the lower right corner of uh, your browser window um, in, inside the Quest. And then... Um, but, but first you should turn on the sound, right? Yes, yes. You, you need to turn on uh, the... Make sure that the sound is working properly on your Quest. And then um, you basically what this uh, demo does is, wouldn't it be insanely great if you could uh, travel back in time 
and experience the landing of man of mankind on the moon the first landing of the uh, on the moon of humans um, if you could see that from the surface of the moon as if you were a live witness uh, located at at the at the perfect spot to have the eagle land right in front of your nose so that's what this uh, demo does and um, we are showing uh, with the audio uh, chatter between Houston and, um, and Neil and Buzz. So you will hear that in your audio and then you will see in the sky um, the eagle approaching and then all come all the way down to land in front of you, uh, kicking up some dust and all of that. And Philip, do, do you want to run the uh, the demo live on this on here? I can. Um, uh, are there people who are who don't have a quest? And um, so we can do that. Um, we can also show them the uh, tranquility base today. Um, it's a bit difficult to know who is doing what. Um, we don't know how many of you are um, in your quests now and um, who are who are doing this. What do you prefer, Manny, that we um, that I share my well, screen? Yes, for people that don't have quests, we should run the demo for them on the screen. <coughs> okay, let me set that up. You will need to make me the host. Um, you you are a panelist, so do you do you have control? Um, yes. So it tells me that somebody else is sharing their screen. So okay, it's all yours now. Okay, I'm setting up as uh, the the screen sharing to show you the um the land the apollo land 11 landing experience via screen sharing okay and here comes the screen sharing uh manny can you confirm that you can see it yes i can see it so notice in the top left corner that there is this uh, little speaker. So I'm not going to un undo it. Oh, well, now I did do. Um, so, so that's the, um, the Cap commu Capcom uh, communications. Now the the lander is far, too far away. You can't see it, but if you look to the left of the sun, uh, you should start picking up some flickers of the exhaust plume. So, this is a realistic uh, recreation of that experience. And um, a little bit to the left of the sun, you will you will see the eagle coming in. I've centered it more or less in the screen. Well, so the eagle is backlit, so it's very hard to see. Right. But we're standing near where it's going to land, so you know. So that's that, that's why it it, it you, you have to wait until it gets closer to start picking up the the, the details. So I'm I'm centering the uh, eagle, and you start see some of its exhaust plume. So.
So I'm adjusting my view to keep the eagle in the center of the screen. And you can see, as Manny said, indeed, it's backlit, which is accurate. Uh, that's, that's as it was um, on that day at that time on the moon. Okay, here we see the final approach. And Neil is, uh, as you remember, using manual control. We start seeing some dust being kicked up. I'm adjusting the, uh, my gaze as it um, approaches. So th this is not a movie, this is virtual reality simulation rendered in real time. And here we go. By the way, the, the real simulation is very smooth. The, uh, the frame rate uh, is, is, a, is because of the Zoom uh, broadcast. So this So so we're down on the moon and um, I want um, now I'm driving I'm walking around the uh, the eagle that just landed and I want to point out a few things. First of all, I want to repeat what Manny said. Uh, he's right. <coughs> that the frame rate that you're seeing in these in the screen sharing via Zoom doesn't do justice to the uh, butter smoothness of the graphics when you actually run it on your own device. That's an artifact of Zoom. So don't, don't think that uh, we have a low frame rate. We actually have this at, at a very nice high frame rate. Another thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, I don't know if you noticed it, but we also simulated because we love details. We love, uh, we lovingly recreated the compression and bending of the contact sensors um, under the under three of the legs. And so in um, a later version of this uh, simulation, <coughs> we will be, we will also um, give the user the ability to, to not stay in one place during the experience of the landing, but to move around and to fly uh, to move their viewpoint uh, on the other side of the eagle while it's doing its landing maneuver uh, so that you can see the sunlit side. And basically you will be able to move your viewpoint around the eagle uh, while it's doing its landing so that you can appreciate the landing from any vantage point that you like. I, I, I didn't do that in this case because uh, the default will be that you are standing more or less uh, on the rim of this uh, crater here, which is accurate. Uh, there was this crater near uh, the landing spot uh, on Tranquility Base. And so basically you're seeing it uh, from that point of view uh, coming in uh, to, to a landing. Uh, the other thing that we will uh, enable uh, in the future is um, that we will be um, doing the, the launch uh, from the moon as well, so that you see the ascent stage uh, lifting off uh, from the moon at the end of the Apollo 11 uh, mission uh, on, the, on the, the lunar phase, the, the moon surface uh, part of the mission. 
And um, we will also be using uh, video grammatry and other technologies, uh, including machine learning, to recreate, uh, again, lovingly recreate all of the EVA activity of both astronauts. Of course, uh, Neil coming down the ladder and setting foot on the moon for the first time. Um, but, but all of the other uh, EVA activity, uh, if we have footage on it, so there's about 80 hours total of uh, footage of all of the Apollo missions on the moon. So part of the virtual moon project will be that we recreate all of that in maximum photorealism, and you will be able to experience those uh, recreations from the, per, from the viewpoint of the astronauts or a disembodied viewpoint uh, where you can be the third astronaut, so to speak, to, to watch them go through all of their activities um, on the moon. Now, for people who are watching this uh, demo on, their, on a flat screen display, <coughs> I need to give you a little bit of a... Um, a legend, a menu for some controls that you can use by means of keyboard toggles. So uh, write this down or memorize it, but the key R, R for Romeo, will reset the experience to its starting point. L for Lima will uh, produce an overlay toggle. Um, v for Victor, uh, dumps the viewpoint, basically takes a screenshot or the location of your, your uh, avatar at that time. And then number one uh, on your keyboard um, goes back 10 seconds in the experience and number two advances uh, 10 seconds into the landing experience. So basically it it's enables you to scroll through the experience faster if you would like to do that. Um, that's it for now for, for this demo. I can uh, segue to show another demo um, of the Tranquility Base today, which uh, shows annotations and the footprints of the astronauts, etc. Shall I do that, Manny, or shall we field some more questions? Uh, you can do that while we see if uh, more questions are coming, but as we may be coming to the close of, the, of this session, I just wanted to invite uh, anyone uh, here. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's much more to this than we we're able to cover, but we covered all the important points. But you know, there's, there's probably a role for every type of skill and ability to, to help uh, Virtual Moon become uh, even more realistic and more believable. So if you have any interest in joining us, please uh, email us and let us know. Um, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to uh, have your input and your contribution and you know, be part of the adventure. Okay, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to switch to the other uh, demo. Okay, so now, um, on your screen, for those uh, not uh, using their Quest, you can see um, in the browser uh, the Tranquility Base uh, scene. So this is what Tranquility Base probably looks like uh, today to the best of our knowledge. Of course, the ascent stage is gone, uh, but all of the experiments um, that the astronauts deposited on the moon are over here. And I'd like to show you, uh, the only thing that probably is not uh, accurate here is the uh, US flag still standing up. Probably it was blown down together with the, the foil, um, well, the, the, uh, the stand for the foil because the foil itself was uh, taken back. Now notice in the lower left corner, um, we have all of these uh, options that we can uh, switch on, and I'm going to switch on most of them. So I'm switching on footprints, labels, sun position control, crosses, and the spacesuit I will do uh, later, maybe. So now that we have all of that switched on, uh, you notice the, the little cross 
boxes, they are there as a kind of a uh, replication of the uh, crosses that you saw in the Hasselblad camera photographs uh, of the Apollo missions. So to, to recreate that feeling, um, what you also see are the actual real footprints. So we, we retrieved this from uh, historical records um, of, the, of the astronauts uh, walking around uh, near the, uh, the eagle, the descent stage of the eagle. And then you also notice that we, as a kind of an augmented reality overlay, that we have put labels over items uh, such as the um, such as the uh, experiments over here, and I'll make my way. Notice how we also simulate the uh, the kind of slow motion uh, movement of an of a spacesuited astronaut on the lunar surface. I'm not doing this with my mouse. I'm just saying go forward, and so um, here we have the laser ranging retro reflector experiment and the lunar dust detector. And we also see over here, I don't know if your screen shows it, but uh, you may remember that uh, Neil went uh, off by himself for a little excursion uh, away from the uh, uh, Eagle. And he went all the way to the rim of the little West crater. And so the this shows one of the uh, useful, um, useful ways of, of um, adding information to a virtual reality scene because um, we see here uh, Neil's tracks going out and coming back uh, to the Little West uh, crater. Uh, one more feature that I'd like to show you is at the bottom of the screen, you see this slider and this puts you in control of the position of the sun. So. I'm now slowly moving the slider uh, to the left, and that makes the, the sun move around uh, our uh, scene. And you see how the virtual reality is uh, fitted with dynamic shadows, which means that the shadows change in real time depending on the position of the sun. And, um, and so this is another great way of exploring the scene because uh, depending on where the sun is, uh, you may not be able to see as much uh, as you would like. Uh, I'll show one more, I'll remove the footprints, the labels, um, the crosses, and I'll add a um, interface for a spacesuit. So this is an idea that we had. This is not an Apollo uh, spacesuit, spacesuit, but a, a futuristic spacesuit, which shows you your orientation um, uh, at the top and then temperature and time, etc. cetera. But um, the reason I'd like to show you this is to show you again, how we, uh, do dynamic lighting and shadows inside of the scene because when I move the sun around again, you will see how this also impacts the interior of the visor of the space suit's helmet. So, um, and we thought this would be a nice overlay to, uh, to give people an additional sense of, um, of immersion uh, psychological immersion in the scene. And um, it doesn't take much imagination uh, anymore to imagine what um, this scene would look like with uh, the astronauts, uh, Buzz and Neil on the surface. Um, maybe a little, this is a geeky little uh, a detail, but I'm going to go closer to the um, flag I, I remind you, by the way, that this is not a standalone um, application. All of this runs inside of a browser and you can access it um, uh, in multi-user mode and um, from any device with, uh, with any browser. So 
I wanted to get really close to the flag to show you, uh, to show off how um, we are managing the light inside of the scene. So depending on, now I'm moving the sun around again, you see the, the shadow of the, of the flag for one and of parts of the, uh, the lander, but you also see how harsh the light is because there's no atmosphere to filter it. The, the, the direct, direct sunlight is extremely harsh on the moon. And so um, that's uh, illustrated here. So in VR, we can basically fine tune these things so as to simulate uh, with a great level of fidelity and accuracy the, the harsh qualities of sunlight uh, in, uh, in, in space on the surface of the moon where there is no atmosphere to soften uh, things um, the way they are softened uh, by Earth's atmosphere on, on planet Earth. So I'm also going to change yet again um, to show you uh, yet another. Philip, can you can you give out the URL for this demo? Uh, which one? The, uh, the one you, the one you just ran. Okay. Um, so for Apollo. 11 landing experience, it was moon.espaces.com slash go. The, this one, we, we're not giving away that uh, URL for the moment, Manny. Um, we okay. can, uh, interested people can ask us and then we, we can uh, give that to them uh, on another occasion. Um, so Helen wanted me to show another uh, space as well. Well, we have a version of the observation deck. Um, but do we have any more questions? How much time do we have left? Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, if it's already to plan, uh, the time is up, but we are flexible for, for you. If you and the attendee would like to go over a little bit, that's fine with us. Okay. Great. So um, while I bring up this other demo, um, what question can we field, Manny? Uh, Manny, you can see Bob. Bob uh, has some more questions. Yes, uh, I typed in there. Has, has Buzz Aldrin seen your demo? Or for that matter, any of the other three of uh, the four remaining uh, lunar surface astronauts? Not yet. We, we'd really like to have it finished before, you know, showing it to them. You're, you're seeing a very early demo uh, preview, uh, but it's not, it's not yet uh, finished. Understood, but they're also not spring chickens anymore. So <laughs> getting even a, a version 1.0 feedback from them, from Dave Scott, Charlie Duke, or Jack Schmidt, the, those three and Buzz are the last four left. So uh, I, I'd recommend contacting the Middle East. Uh, do, do you have uh, any direct contact with, with them? Um, uh, through the uh, through various space museums. Uh, uh, is your email available um, in the um, documentation for this, uh, for this meeting, the invitation or so on? Yes. All right. I, I'd like to uh, uh, follow up with you after this uh, event then. Okay. Wonderful. So yeah, I, we would love nothing more to, to show it to uh, Charlie Duke and, and to Buzz and to old and, and to you know to ask them for pointers which parts we, we still need to polish and uh, and 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 to confirm uh, that we got the lighting right and and all the details. Yes, and also the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. The editor at the BBC, uh, blanking on his name right now, but. He's done a, a yeoman service and and basically fine tuning all of the uh, 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 existing transcripts and photographs and so on. And he 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 knows a lot about what happened on those EVAs. He'd other be another great uh, resource for you. 
All right, I, am I sharing the screen? Are you seeing my screen now? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I can see it. I can see this. Uh, thank you. Let's build the future okay. together. Yeah, it has, it has my email address there. You can take it down. And anybody who's interested in finding out more or working with us or any ideas or suggestions, uh, yeah, please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Also, um, let us know what you thought of the uh, of the immersive Oculus experience, if you had a chance to try it. I saw some comments in the chat, Manny. Uh, one person um, said, this is so cool. Another one uh, confirmed, indeed, very cool, very cool in the Oculus. So I'm delighted that it works uh, well for you guys. Um, I also would like to um how can i share my screen again uh if you could stop thank you manny um i also wanted to show you as a kind of a, an avant premiere don't um don't publicize this too much but this is an, an early design for the observation deck of saline city on top of malapert mountain and so this is a um the idea would be that from inside Saline City, without putting on a spacesuit, you can go to the top of Malapert Mountain and you can see the landscape around you. This is, by the way, this is actual uh, elevation data from uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this is the actual view from the top of Malapert Mountain. Um, and um, so we, we have that ready um, and we have some uh, other things here that uh, you will, you probably will like. Let me show you, for example, uh, we can bring a model of the moon uh, inside of this uh, exhibition space and Mars and Earth, etc. cetera. So um, th this is all work in progress, but uh, one of the ideas that we have is that, of course, when we bring up a, a 3D model of the moon like this, that it will be interactive, that you will be able to uh, rotate it, uh, twirl it around, but also that you will be able to see uh, mark markers on here that you can click to then teleport to another location in Virtual Moon. So, um, any remaining questions? There's a question on roadmap of development. Um, well, so so generally, we are at the early stages. Um, uh, we are going to implement all the ideas, all the concepts that we uh, that we spoke about, um, and uh, and keep expanding on on the on on, on the basic um, simulation. Uh, again, uh, aggregating ideas from everyone that uh, that are interesting, interesting activities to do on the moon and so on. So we'll, we'll keep adding features and interactivity to the simulation. Um, and that's that's basically the, the roadmap. That's that's basically, uh, you know, what we'll, we'll keep improving it. Also, um, as the technology improves and performance improves, um, and new missions are sent to the moon and bring back more detailed data of, of the surface features and so on, we'll keep incorporating all of that into an evolving uh, simulation. That's right. So in, in the meantime, as you can see on your screen, I just switched on some features um, because we're thinking of uh, having a virtual museum, space museum on the moon. And uh, so the observation deck might have some exhibits uh, of that um, space. Remember that you all of these experiences will be fully multi-user, which means that you can go and hang out with your friends uh, no matter what device they have, you will be able to go and hang out uh, at the top of Malaport, uh, Malaport um, in the Saline observation deck uh, space or at the Tranquility Base or any of the lunar landings or anywhere on the moon, really. You can uh, 
uh, just like with Lunar Explorer, you will be able to drop uh, a pin on them anywhere on the moon and explore that. And uh, you will be uh, walking around in um, a virtual reality transposition of the actual elevation data and photography taken by the Lunar Re Reconnaissance Orbiter or other probes if uh, there are uh, probes that send back more detailed uh, information than the LRO. Uh, this particular uh, space is uh, live and uh, multi-user, so uh, I shared the link uh, in the chat. And if you copy paste that one in your browser, uh, you can actually join me here inside of this uh, observation deck at the top of Malapert Mountain. Do we have any more questions, Manny? I don't see any new questions. Let's see. Well, I have a question. Would this be kind of uh, in the future as part of Meta Facebook? Uh, um, no, it will not be part of uh, Facebook's uh, meta. Uh, we are building, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we are building our own metaverse. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, so I, I can be forgiven for thinking that I know a thing or two about how to build metaverses. And uh, I've built uh, five before, and this is the, my sixth uh, that we are building. And so the technology of virtual moon will be the exact same technology as that we're developing for our metaverse. And, um, and virtual moon will, be, will have its embassy uh, inside of uh, our metaverse and uh, what will also be working as a standalone version. And so um, you will be able to access everything of virtual moon eventually via our metaverse or directly at the virtual moon website very good very good uh so you say you were going to post a link for this one um, yes i did oh, you just did I don't see it though where uh, did you post in the um, chat i'll do it again i did it a second time i see that it posted to the text chat did, did you post it to everyone or post to certain person for the two uh, you, you can see that. Oh, I see. I see. I, I need to send it to everyone. Yep, my mistake. Now I sent it to everybody. Paula, I think, do you want to say something? I saw you, your mic is on. Paula? Oh, I got a message saying I should turn on my mic, so I did. <laughs> but um, I just uh, put in a question about the Artemis program. And so, as you probably know, um, we're working um, on this Artemis program that now has many members uh, internationally um, to get people working together on the moon. And I think that, uh, in, especially in terms of the planning period, uh, which is ongoing now as we speak, um, I think that this could be very helpful to that program and to the discussions. Paula, do, do you work on the, on the program yourself? No, sorry. I used to. I worked for NASA headquarters for 10 years, and then I worked for Boeing for 20 years. Um, and uh, now uh, I'm just an observer. Uh, do you, do you, would you be able to uh, let us know what the right contacts are to reach out to? Um, I would go to nasa.gov okay. and and look at the and and uh, look at Moon or and or Artemis program. The Artemis program is this whole new group of countries that are working together to plan developments on the Moon. And um, and it, they've signed up on the Artemis program. That's what you need to look for. It might be A R T I M U S. I just see. I said. -E, I'm not sure how to spell it. Um, A-R-T-E-M-I-S. A-R-T-E-M-I-S is correct, I think. Yeah. So I think that you should look into this because I can see this as a really promising feature that would help in the developments of the moon 
by various countries and various companies. Agreed, agreed. And uh, Absolutely. We, we have already reached out to a number of companies and organizations and, and uh, uh, let them know that we're here and that we, we're ready to work together. But, uh, but we, we're really hoping to be a little further along and we'll continue reaching out. I think if you contact NASA, you know, they have a whole overview of this program and what's going on and who the contacts are and so forth. Um, and um, I just see a real role for this. It's, I don't see it so much as a commercial role at the moment uh, for, for NASA, but as a role to get, help get this going and to have all these players from around the world looking at these visions for planning. I mean, it really, it, you know, it's not just imagining what this is gonna look like being on the surface of the moon and developing, um, but um, it's more than imagining, you know, it really gives you, as I'm watching all of your imagery, I'm, I'm thinking of the prospects of all of this. It, it, it seems like a great match for the, you know, for the technical planning Yes. Of, of Artemis. Absolutely. Yes, and that, and that, that is the, uh, the reason behind uh, uh, Virtual Moon Pro, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with Virtual Moon Pro is to have, um, have people be able to use it as a serious planning and engineering tool. Yes, for everyone to work with. So everyone's yeah. on the same page. Yes. And one other thing I was going to suggest is that you were talking about Buzz Aldrin and maybe getting in touch with him. I don't know if he's well enough to do that, but you should get in touch with his son, Andy, Andy Aldrin. Um, he was a professor at the University of Florida. I don't know if he's still doing that. Yeah, he is. I, I have a friend that just finished taking a course with him, so he oh, has good. a direct contact to him. So Andy really can talk with you about a lot of this. Okay. Good suggestion. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're most welcome. Okay. So, um, any any comments, reactions, or questions are uh, welcome. Um, you can get in touch with uh, with us uh, via the email that uh, Manny showed on the screen and um, maybe Manny you could also repeat it one last time in uh, in the ch in the text chat so that uh, there can be a follow through on this presentation and um, we'd love to hear from you we'd love to uh, hear your thoughts on these uh, early demos um, Quick reminder that all of this was work in progress, not finalized, not finished. Um, so you were, you were invited to take a look on what is effectively a construction site for Virtual Moon. So the construction okay. site you mean is the moon.espace.com? Yes, um, slash go uh, for your um, for experiencing the the virtual moon landing um, uh, in in your quest. Um, if you want to experience it on a, on a flat screen uh, device like a, a PC desktop or a Mac desktop. I would recommend at this juncture uh, to use Chrome. Uh, it, it does work in other browsers, but the browser in which it is, it is working the very best at this moment is uh, Chrome. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to make another suggestion if I may, and that is that there are um, a couple of planning committees under the UN, uh, cope with, you know, uh, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Yes. Um, and these committees are working on, on developments on the moon and on Mars. 
And they're also working on legal issues, how to manage this. Um, and um, you might be of help to them as well. <laughs> Just a mm -hmm. thought. Yes, we know uh, Michelle Hanlon, who's, uh, who, who, who does work with the, uh, with the United Nations on her For, For All Humankind organization. Uh -huh, yes. So uh, yes, we'll, we'll follow up on that as well. Okay, if there are no further questions, I think we've uh, reached a natural resting point for this um, presentation. I just, would like just to- one, Sorry, just one final announcement. Uh, we have a current uh, website, virtualmoon.space. It's, uh, it's a, also an early version. It's a placeholder. We'll, we'll have a brand new website uh, coming online in the next, uh, in the next few weeks. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, folks, this is really amazing. It's a great experience and a great future uh, for the space exploration. Uh, so uh, in other way, you know, has been, has been focusing on like a rocketry, propulsion, uh, aviation, you know, those engineering side. But I think this virtual reality is getting uh, lots of attention. Many aerospace companies start to put resources and people in it. Uh, so this is definitely a, a very exciting future for aerospace. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much again, Phil and many, uh, which you can, uh, as many said, uh, when you're ready, uh, come back and uh, speak to us again. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your joining us today. The video will be posted after the event, and then you'll receive the email link, and it will be posted on our website as well. So, once again, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And with that from inside from from the virtual moon we're signing off and uh saying bye and we look forward to meeting you on the virtual moon soon exactly yeah build, build the space there we can meet absolutely yes. bye for now thank you so much for your time and for your questions and for your comments thank you everyone thank you so much bye bye